Did you know that there are prisons where both women and men are held together? Yes, yes, you heard it right. There are such closed institutions in the world. A man and a woman interacting in a confined space, what should one expect? Will there be a tragedy or could everything end amicably? Stay tuned. What follows will be interesting and intriguing. In the USA, there is an unusual practice of housing men and women in the same prison, but on different floors or in different buildings. For example, in the large federal Marison prison, inmates of both female and male genders are held. Male prisons pose a danger for women who are born male. According to a study by the U.S. Department of Justice, more than one-third of transgender inmates were subjected to sexual violence, and transgender women are more than 13 times more likely to be sexually assaulted in prison than cisgender women. The reality is a real horror. Arrested transgender women find themselves in an environment where they become victims of violent crimes, far more often than outside prison. This depressing situation might be somewhat improved if such women were simply allowed to be held in women's prisons. In male prisons, transgender women are forced to cut their hair and are not allowed to wear clothes that match their gender. This is yet another severe ordeal for many such women who already suffer from depression. Transgender people often become victims of persecution, mockery, and attacks, especially in male prisons. Many of them hope for protection from the prison administration, but usually, this only happens after they have been victims of sexual violence. They are often kept separate from other inmates, protected from physical harm by others. However, they are still not protected from harassment by guards and prison staff, and suffer from social isolation and lack of access to education and vocational training. Here's an interesting fact. In 2014, a correctional colony was established in Svidervolsk Oblast, where both men and women were held simultaneously. This experiment was forced as one of the women's colonies was closed, and part of its contingent was transferred to an existing male correctional institution, where they were allocated a separate space. Another striking example is from 2019, when a 26-year-old woman from Kazakhstan became the first woman in this Asian country to be incarcerated in a correctional facility for particularly dangerous male criminals. She was sentenced for committing a brutal murder. The court decided to transfer the convicted woman to a male colony due to gross violations of the regime. There, she was held in a separate block of cells. Also, investigative detention centers in Russia are not segregated by gender. Of course, women and men are not held in the same cell. They are maximally separated from each other. But this is more of the exception than the rule. Russian laws prohibit placing suspects and accused of different genders, minors and adults, sick and healthy, convicted and just suspected in the same cell. Of course, not all these rules are always followed, but the mandatory condition is that the separate detention of individuals of different genders in male and female cells, even in court, they try to place them in different corners. However, what about women who have felt like men since birth? What do they do with them when they commit offenses? This topic has become very relevant, and we will talk about it today. Let's begin. Our first story is about Dee Farmer, a U.S. citizen and transgender individual. She fought for many years against the placement of transgender women in prisons with male criminals. Dee often faced problems in prison related to her appearance. While incarcerated, Farmer behaved provocatively, wearing her prison shirt to cover only one shoulder. She had beautifully styled, long curly hair, smooth skin, and large silicone breasts. She was held in a cell among men, murderers and rapists who committed particularly brutal crimes. Dee herself had not committed murder. At 18, she was sentenced to 20 years for credit card fraud and an additional 30 years for theft. As a result, she faced 50 long years in prison. Initially, there were plans to place Dee in a maximum security prison in Pennsylvania. When the prison warden saw her, he said, no, she cannot be left here under any circumstances. Over the next three years, she was transferred to several other prisons, and everywhere she went, the administration faced difficulties regarding her presence. The inmates reacted aggressively to her, and Dee was repeatedly involved in disturbances, fights, and scuffles. This led to her being raped by fellow inmates in an Indiana prison. Hoping for punishment of the perpetrators, she complained to the prison administrator, despite threats of capital punishment in response. Dee thought she would at least be taken to a doctor, but that didn't happen. The prison officer filed a report with the authorities, but no further action was taken by responsible officials. 
It was later revealed that D had tested positive for HIV a year earlier. Following this, she was placed in isolation, then transferred to another prison. In 1991, without leaving the prison, she filed a lawsuit in federal court against the prison authorities for allowing other inmates to rape her. However, the defendants claim that they could not have foreseen such an event, and a year later, the court denied Dee's claim for compensation, both physical and moral. Dee did not give up and filed an appeal, which was also rejected. Then, she petitioned the Supreme Court, and her case attracted the attention of lawyers from the American Civil Liberties Union. Eventually, the Supreme Court judge ruled that the prison authorities should be prosecuted for negligence. Rape in prison should not be part of the punishment for an inmate, the judge's verdict stated. Her case was then sent for reconsideration to the federal court. Unfortunately, the same judge who had rejected her previous claim reviewed the case, and Dee lost the lawsuit. This president, despite its negative outcome, created a legal practice used by other lawyers in cases of transgender women. Sometimes, the will of one person is enough to change the law. However, it's not always enough to change the world. D. Farmer made life easier for many inmates, but much time must pass before prisons become safe for people. Now, about the terrible case involving the Englishwoman Vicki Thompson. When she was arrested, she immediately informed her friends of her intentions. If she were sent to a male prison, she intended to end her life. Soon, Vicky was found dead in her cell. The exact cause of her death was not disclosed by the police and authorities. Her friends and journalists have no doubt that she carried out her threat. The day before her death, Vicky spoke on the phone with her boyfriend, Robert Still. They planned a meeting in prison, but he did not arrive in time. As Vicky told Robert, the other inmates consistently tormented her because of her appearance. She looked like a woman, but was in a prison with men. Little is known about her life. She was only 21 years old, loved and spoiled by her family. She enjoyed parties and always appeared cheerful. In 2015, she stole a mobile phone from a teenager and robbed two stores, stealing cosmetics and toiletries. After that, she was sentenced to 12 months in prison. At that time, she had not undergone gender reassignment surgery. But for 10 years, Vicky dressed in a woman's clothes and, with her mother's help, changed her name in her teenage years. She identified as a woman, and everyone around her perceived her as such. In court, Vicky's lawyer tried to explain to the jury that his client was transgender, very sensitive, and impressionable. He requested that she be sent to a woman's prison, or at least have her sentence reduced. But all his attempts were unsuccessful. Good night, princess. I love you and think about you every minute. We will definitely meet when my time comes. These were the words written by Robert, Vicky's boyfriend, in his Facebook post after her death. In 2021, the prisoner Nazar Gulovich, who was in the capital's Women's Detention Center No. 6, found himself in a difficult situation. Identified as a man in his passport, but psychologically as a woman, he faced a possibility of being transferred to the Vladimir male colony. Nazir Gulovich was born with female physical traits, but always felt himself to be a man. He changed his documents, underwent hormone therapy, and dreamed of gender reassignment surgery, but had not completed it. Nazar Gulovich is a well-known figure, having participated in a popular Russian TV show. Gulovich was once arrested for fraud. Initially, after his arrest, Nazar spent time in the hospital ward cell of Mastrakoya Tashina, and during the investigation and after sentencing, was held in a woman's detention center. This was the only safe place for him, especially as other detention centers refused to take him. In one of them, the inmates nearly killed him. During a medical examination, he had to undress in front of all the prisoners, who first opened their mouths in surprise and then started making complaints. Eventually, Nazar spent two years in solitary confinement in the woman's detention center, where he almost committed suicide. Gulovich hoped for an acquittal by the court as a victim of fraudsters, or for punishment already served, and wanted to leave the courtroom a free man. But the judge thought otherwise. Nazar was recognized as an accomplice in the crime. Unfortunately, the fact that the prisoner had not fully completed the gender transition was ignored by the judge. Considering the time already served, Nazar had less than six months left, and in the day, for a day and a half, calculated just over three months. He and human rights activists hoped that Nazar would be kept in the women's detention center. The transgender individual said that he would not survive in either a male or female colony. In March, Nazar arrived at Detention Center 3 in Rishif, Sver region. 
In April, the Federal Penitentiary Service decided that the presence of a transgender man in Russia was undesirable. After that, the Ministry of Internal Affairs decided to deport him, despite his Russian wife and registration in the country. For many transgender women currently in the male prisons, sexual violence is just one of many problems they face. Many of them do not even have access to hormones necessary for maintaining the health of the body and mind. This was the case with Ophelia Delanta, a black transgender woman in a male prison in Virginia. The State Department of Corrections ruled that hormone therapy was not medically necessary for her, and therefore they would no longer pay for it. Past court rulings have stated that prisons must do everything in their power to ensure the safety and health of all inmates. But transgender inmates bear the burden of proving that they are in danger or have a medical need for hormone therapy. It seems that there are no established rules or guidelines for why transgender women who have not undergone surgery are placed in male prisons. Inmates assert that, in most cases, officers examine their genitals during arrest and made decisions based on this, regardless of their gender identity. Several transgender women wanted to transfer their cases to court, hoping to be placed in a woman's prison, but they were unsuccessful, partly due to the documents stating that inmates do not have the right to be placed in a specific prison. It creates the impression that the criminal justice system does not consider transgender women who have undergone surgery to be real women. This creates a terrible situation where transgender women are placed in prisons that are completely unsafe for them and poorly equipped to provide proper care. Until all transgender women are recognized as the women they are, and their medical needs and safety are considered priorities, prison life will remain a cruel and terrifying experience for too many transgender women. This is just a brief list of what can happen to a woman in a male prison. There are theories that placing inmates of different genders together, despite many negative aspects of cohabitation, could create situations that positively impact each individual. In practice, the main issue was currently transgender identity. This involves the process of a person changing their group identity, which they believe they belong to by right of birth or upbringing. The only possible solution might be the creation of separate colonies for such individuals. Internationally, various measures have been developed to prevent violence, selection of those who will live in the same cell, implementation of practices against bullying, creation of an anonymous complaint submission system. In 2019, the UK opened the first department for such prisoners, and similar departments exist in the USA. In Russia, however, there are no practices for distributing transgender people by colony, although they have been discussed by the Federal Penitentiary Service since 2015. The problem exists, and ways to solve it must be found, and we will definitely tell you about them in the future.